Welcome to this week's video. This week's video, I'm going to be doing a five pros and five cons video review of the BMW i3. It's the new 120 amp hour version, also known as the 40 kilowatt hour battery version. And we're gonna be going over some of the pros and cons I've learned as a BMW owner of this car now for over six months. Now, if you don't know who I am, I'm Nicholas Ramo. I make videos every single week about electric cars, be that the Renault Zoe, the BMW i3, or Teslas. I'll take you through my entire journey of owning an electric car, be that reviews of the cars, how they work, insightful tips, and other things to do with electric technology and environmental issues. If you are interested in learning more about electric cars or how to be more sustainable, then please go down below, click the subscribe button. There's a little bell icon there. If you're interested in seeing the videos every single week and not missing one, click the bell icon. You'll be notified by YouTube every time I make an upload. Now, before I start getting into the cons of the car, it's really worth noting that these cons and issues I have with the car are my personal pros and my personal cons. If you have one of these or you're thinking of buying one of these, you're not necessarily going to have the same issues that I find with it or you're not gonna find the same benefits that I do. But this is what I found after having the car six months and what bothers me. The first one is the fruit or the frunk if you're in the US. The only way of opening it is by the key. Now this might not seem irritating. However, if you like me, like to unlock your car by the app, which you can do on the BMW app, which is absolutely great, you can't open the car from inside. There's no internal buttons to open this front boot. The only way of doing it is by the key, and that is a little bit irritating. There is another issue, which I'm gonna tie into one, number one of the cons of this car, and that is this front boot here isn't waterproof, which is ridiculous, seeing they put all your charge cables in it, the, the emergency tire kit. I mean, you can't use it for anything else that you don't wanna get wet because it isn't waterproof. There is two drain holes at the bottom of it to stop it from filling up with water, but why would you not make it waterproof? I was almost the prime example of why only having it on the key is a bad issue, and that is I almost locked the key in the front boot. Now, it would have been a complete disaster and I wouldn't have had to get the spare key. There is ways to open the front boot. There is a video on the top right of this video on how to open stuff like this and the rear boot if it's jammed or you've locked it and the emergency pull cords are where they are. But you could have had a slight panic if you were out and about shopping and you didn't know where it was. The one thing that I find very, very irritating with the BMW infotainment system is it's not a touchscreen. Now, yes, you could argue that the screen is too far back to be a touchscreen, but they could have easily made the screen here or you know, brought it forward and it could be touchscreen. Now, like I said, these are issues that are unique to me that I find irritating. A lot of people prefer the BMW iDrive with the scroll wheel and not being a touchscreen. But to me, in the modern century, where you've got touchscreen iPhones, touchscreen sat-navs, touchscreen tom-toms, having a touchscreen is very intuitive and very easy to use and it just it doesn't make any sense not to have any of this being a touchscreen. It's it's silly. Now I could understand them having a bit of a compromise of being partly a touchscreen and partly a scroll wheel to make you know make some of the navigation a bit more easy. But it, to, to me, it should just be a touchscreen. And I, I, I know this is going to cause a lot of debate where people think it's a great idea that it's a scroll wheel. Let me know. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. I'd love to know. Do you agree with me? Should all sat navs in cars now be a touchscreen, or do you prefer the old manual sort of scroll wheels that the BMW iDrive's got? Now, my next little issue about this BMW is to do with the heating control system, and the reason I am picking on it is because it is a thirty-five thousand pound car when new. The Renault Zoe, in considerably the same class sector of a hatchback, is around about the £20,000 battery owned mark for the ZE40 model. At the time of recording this video, the ZE50 prices weren't out, but I assume the ZE50 battery owned version is going to be around about 24, so still 10 grand cheaper than, than the BMW equivalent car. And the Nissan Leaf, uh, comment down below in the comments. I'm not sure what the Nissan Leaf prices are for the 40 kilowatt. It is literally every every time I check, it's all over the place. Uh, I only really know the Zoe price off the top of my head. So if you do know the Nissan Leaf 40 price, please leave it down in the comments below. But my issue is this is a 35,000 pound car that has the same heating technology that the Generation One Nissan Leafs had in, and that is it does not use a heat pump. What it can do 
if you pay for it. Now, a lot of BMW drivers and non sort of previous EV drivers will not know that not having a heat pump is extremely detrimental to your range in the winter. And I mean extremely detrimental. It, can, it will basically suck as much battery power as it can to heat the cabin. Now, it does tail off very quickly as soon as the cabin gets warm, but to me, a 35,000 pound car, should the only way of heating this cabin be using basically elect uh, heating up a, an electronic coil to, to warm the cabin or should they be using a heat pump like the Renault Zoe or other makes and in my mind yes they should. I've mentioned this issue before and that is this boot is terribly small. Now it doesn't look like I've got much in here. I basically got my scooter, my Omi cable, and then the uh, just a normal public cable that I use. Now, technically I don't really need the public cable in here, and I don't really need the Omi cable, but the scooter just about fits. And I've got to slant it in at a weird angle and put it in. Now in the Zoe, I can just literally pick it up and drop it in the boot, um, and I can have the Zoe full of rubbish, and I mean full of stuff. My wife's boot is the messiest car in the world. And the issue here is when I went down to Heathrow for my honeymoon, I couldn't fit two large suitcases in the back of here. I could only just about fit one of the hand luggage bags. Well, I actually managed to squeeze both the hand luggage bags in, to be fair. I did leave this in and leave the seats folded up. Now, in the Zoe, I was able to fit the two large, the two large suitcases in the boot of the Zoe, and I could just about squeeze one of the hand luggage bags in. I did test, I tested it in both, but we needed to take the i3 because we needed the range of the i3 in the old the Zoe we've got to 22 kilowatt. The issue, main issue for me is because when we're going to Heathrow, we're stopping at Milton Keynes to film some stuff for Milton Keynes Experience Centre. So if you look at the video top right of that, we're at Milton Keynes Experience Centre. I was parked in the car park and I basically had two large suitcases in my rear passenger seats and the two miniature hand cases in the back. Now, I found the hand cases were hidden, but the two large suitcases weren't. So what I had to do was I had to bring my dog cover that I use in the Zoe to make it look like there was nothing in the back seats and kind of cover it up. And that's not ideal. Now, if you were a family of three or a family of four and you were going to the airport, you couldn't take my three, which is ridiculous. It's it's a it's a four-seater car. It should be able to fit four seat four people in with at least two hand luggage bags in it, and it can't. It, sorry, not hand luggage bags, with two main bags, and it just couldn't do it. That's really, really irritating me. Now, this particular issue isn't just a BMW issue. A lot of car manufacturers do that. And it's this here, it's the fact that the, the charge flap is a petrol flap. It looks like a petrol flap, it's a bit ugly. It doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to be here. It could be pretty much anywhere. The, the, the flap and the charging socket don't need to go into a fuel tank and loop down in a certain order to fit the fuel tank in the back. It's a, it's a cable. It can pretty much go wherever it wants, wherever they can fit the cable. Now, there's, there's a several solutions. You can go down the, the Renault route, which uses a lovely front nose bit, which is my favorite, because if you go into a rapid charger or a, your home charger, you, can, you do have to drive forward in all the time, but it's always in the center of the car, so it can always reach it, no matter how long the cable is at a rapid. The issue with the BMW is if you want to charge at a polar rapid, for example, you need to reverse in. And if the space is blocked on one side and the cable won't reach, you can't charge. Now, Tesla have gone through a similar thing and they fitted theirs right at the back on one of the headlights, which is almost as ideal as a Zoe because it, it's, it's very easy to reach and stretch the cable no matter which way the rapid is. But the ideal way for me would be directly on the back or directly on the front or copying what Audi have done with the e-tron, which is have flaps both sides. They've got CCS one side and an AC one side. And the reason why that's convenient is if you have a garage that you park into and you can't stretch the cable around, you can fit AC either side and just plug it in and charge. If you're enjoying watching this guy and you want to see more of him every single week, then there's a subscribe button down there over there. Just click that and you'll be able to be subscribed to me every single week. If you don't enjoy watching this guy, just give the video a thumbs up and uh, watch it all the way to the end. And if you really, really enjoy watching this video and you want to get more of your friends to drive EVs and learn more about EVs, then please send them a link to this channel, tell them about EVs, tell them about my channel and they can learn more. Feel free to always ask questions in my comment section. I will always, always answer comments.
Quickly moving over to the pros, one of the things that you hear often about electric cars is that they are not green to build. Now that is completely untrue and we're not going into that in today's video. What we will go into is why this is a particularly green car and that is because they use recycled materials all the way throughout the car. They don't use a metal chassis really, they use a carbon fiber structure chassis and the car plant that they build these in is 100% renewable energy. They use mainly wind and a little bit of solar, but everything, all the energy that's used by that factory is offset by green, green wind turbines that should close by to the factory. Very similar to what Tesla do in their factory. So this is a particularly greener car. On a plus point on something to do with being green, if you probably know that the less meat you eat, the lower you can lower your CO2. And I've recently gone to a slightly vegan diet but I'm still eating the occasional bit of meat but hardly any compared to what I used to. I've gone a little bit pescatarian but my vegan friends will be happy to know that the steering wheel on this car doesn't use any real leather. It's all fake leather which means no animals were killed in the making of this car so a lot of vegans will be very very happy with that. Now if you're buying a BMW then you would expect this anyway but I'm going to note it anyway and that is the build quality on these cars is very very high and I mean very high. There's no problems with panel gaps, there's no problems with faults, the car's delivered with perfect paint when it arrives to your door, perfect wheels, you don't have to crib your car like you would say, I'm sorry to say this, like a Tesla. There, I do I have seen some of the Model 3s in Belgium uh, that were delivered and there was various little tiny faults that BMW wouldn't have released. Now Tesla, yes, will sort them, that's fine. They will not argue, They, you will report the fault, they will fix it. The, the problem is, new cars shouldn't be delivered with a fault now in fairness i did this car did develop a fault two months after owning it and that was the iDrive uh, joystick thing stopped working and yes bmw fixed it straight away so i'm trying to weigh some balance but they they are better built you can't deny it the paint quality is a lot better the panel gaps are, you know the non-existent it's a bmw you do expect that kind of build quality now you might be wondering why the hell i'm down here at the bonnet and that is because these babies these little headlights are the most amazing things i have ever seen on any car they are led headlights on the 120 amp hour bmw i3 and they are super bright and i mean super they, they are i will try and record the best footage i can on the darkest road i can but bear in mind i am recording this in july but i will try and record the darkest road i can with standard beams and then main beams but they are super bright they are literally the best headlights i have ever seen in my entire life on any car now one of the things that i really do like about the i3 and one of the things that I've really started to experience that I enjoy so much about it, that is the sheer acceleration and performance this thing gives you. I mean, it's 170 brake horsepower in a carbon fiber chassis that just is just, it's just so lovely, great, smooth acceleration like you'd expect from any EV, but there's just so much of it. I mean, the other main benefit about this is the handling as well. Now you think with these skinny little BMW i3 tires that the handling just wouldn't be there and but it is it's just handled so well you can really like throw it around these corners and it just grips it's just effortless which neatly brings me on to something that's kind of linked to the build quality and that other thing is this car is so quiet I mean it really is quiet EV. Now it's very hard to understand this unless you've had a unless you've driven an EV. But if you if you're driving a nice car, diesel, petrol, the one thing you don't notice is how you hear every creak and crack in a car because diesel and nice cars you're fighting with a noisy combustion engine. And that noisy combustion engine takes over a lot of the noise that you hear. So when you drive an EV like the Renault Zoe you hear every little creak crack noise that that car can make and one of the issues that people find in the Renault Zoe R110 ZE40 is, is that they have a bit of a noisy boot creak at the back but the BMW is quiet and it, it's so quiet that you don't hear too much road noise from the wheels too much noise from any dash interior it's perfectly sound deadened very very quiet and it's probably one of the quietest EVs I've driven and sat in I mean, if we just quiet for a second, 
and just, just listen. Put all the windows up. Nothing. Just nothing. Just quiet. It's perfect. I love it. Well done, BMW. And I guess the last thing to say for me is thank you very much for watching this week's video. If you haven't already, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to click subscribe down below and check out some of my other videos on my channel. Thanks very much, and I'll see you again next week. Goodbye.